Thank you, Barry. Um, and uh, my thanks to the Institute for providing this very welcome excuse to um, come back to Dublin, which is always a, a great pleasure. Um, given the... Sub uh, let me say, first of all, I apologise for not, not standing up. I'm not... Uh, standing is... Uh, I'm having a little trouble standing right at the moment, so um, I, shall, uh, I shall sit if that's OK. Um, given the subject of, the, uh, of today's seminar, it's uh, inevitable my mind should uh, go back um, to what is now 16 years ago, when I, uh, about this time of year, I, I popped into Dublin at the very start of the Irish 2004 presidency um, to confer with the, with the presidency about, um, about the mission of uh, trying to establish the EDA in, in Brussels. And um, that's sliding into history now, but it's actually very fresh in my memory because the whole experience that began then and lasted for the next three or four years, I remember with enormous um, affection. It was, uh, I suppose, the highlight of my, my professional life. Um, not least, I think, because it's almost impossible to remember now. Um, perhaps Mary will bear me out on this. The sort of degree of, of, of confidence and um, optimism which surrounded the whole European enterprise in Brussels in those early days just after the turn of the millennium. Goodness me, Europe was, was riding the wheel of history. We were um, on the threshold of this massive enlargement. Um, we were part of the, of the almost now effortless triumph of liberal democracy across the globe. Um, European values, uh, Western values, as we would then have called them, um, were effectively unchallenged. And Europe was a huge buy stock at that time. And indeed, in relation to the stuff that I was charged to interest myself in, which was, which was uh, um, advancing the European defence project, there was a very broad consensus and indeed enthusiasm for the sort of basic concepts of trying to do more together and uh, more pooling of efforts and resources to be more efficient and to be more effective <coughs> and to provide the tools for European foreign policy, which in those days in the security and defence realm was, featured, was focused very much on this idea of, of crisis management, particularly in our neighbourhood, trying to um, export our, our stability and, and uh, our democratic values to the neighbourhood and further afield um, in support of the UN and acting as a, as a, a, European, um, as a, a European actor. So the... Um, the, the mood was, was I'm not saying anything was, anything was particularly easy, but the mood was very much in, in one felt one was riding a tide that was, making, that was heading in a, a conducive direction. And, of course, um, you know, I, I was privileged to start working in Brussels in uh, partnership with what has become, I think, a very sort of famous Irish presidency under Anne Anderson in, in Brussels, and I had some wonderful colleagues in the delegation there, young men called Declan Kelleher, um, another young man called Morris Quinn. I think that neither of them have found their careers um, uh, handicapped by, by this experience. So anyway, we got that job done, and of course the Irish presidency did various other remarkable jobs in their um, very successful six months. Um, this was a, a lesson to me in what small states can achieve um, in the European context. So when, um, I suppose, uh, uh, 14, 15, uh, 14, oh, however long it was, a dozen years on, um, we had our Brexit referendum. It wasn't a particular surprise to me, even if it was a cause of uh, certain ruefulness, to see how rapidly the Irish diplomacy managed to, uh, well, let's be honest, truss up and kipper the London government at the very beginning of the Brexit withdrawal negotiations and um, secure the uh, very effective support of 27 member states for those negotiations. So um, there we go. Small states can make outsized contributions to European enterprises. Um, and I think in the defence field, you know, in some ways, there are, there are advantages because, uh, as demonstrated by the, uh, by the Irish presidency to which I've referred, um, 
Small states can be agile and they can be unfreighted with national interests, which can often get in the way of achieving European objectives. Indeed, I wonder whether, in some ways, the more relevant determinants of different European states' ability and, and willingness to contribute to our subject today, European defence and security, a more relevant determinant than, than sheer size is, uh, are other factors, um, particularly uh, well, geography, obviously enough. Um, it seems to me that uh, you know, Ireland and Portugal are, are, are small states, so are the Baltic states, but it's inevitable that given these different geographical positions, they, these countries should all have very different views of, uh, of the security environment and what is needed to um, secure defense and security. Indeed, I noticed the other day that the, uh, that the Latvian foreign minister um, made an impassioned plea for the French to extend nuclear deterrence to the Baltic states. Um, I have to admit, sotto voce, this was music to my ears. I kind of suspect that that will not have gone down so, so well in the Irish context. Um, so perceptions of, of appropriate defence policies, appropriate nature of the European defence enterprise and so on, um, are inevitably hugely influenced by, by geography and threat perceptions. And another factor, of course, is um, perhaps even more important is just history. I mean, we are all more or less prisoners of our history, if we're, whether we're Germans, unable to huge difficulties in stepping up into an appropriate strategic rule for Moreau for very obvious reasons. The French who suffer from arguably the alternative, you know, the opposite problem of uh, stepping up too much as a consequence of centuries of gloire followed by, um, <coughs> followed by the catastrophe of 1940, which I think lies behind so much French national ambition. Or the Brits, where oh, glorious colonial history has um, contributed um, catastrophically, in my view, to the recent Brexit disaster. Um, so we're all trapped by our histories, and I suppose that uh, history, too, is responsible for the what I understand to be the rather idiosyncratic or very, I don't mean that in any derogatory sense, but the rather special Irish view on defence and security, this combination of, of Military neutrality allied, nonetheless, with a, with a strong sense of, of international engagement. Um, and I want to pick up that international engagement point because I do think that um, here is a very fine example of where small states can make outsized contributions, as you have a long and proud tradition of doing um, with the UN, with uh, ESDP and CSDP operations, and still to this day, I think you have sort of 600, uh, 600 um, armed forces personnel deployed in different parts of the of the globe. And your recent update to your white paper affirmed your your continuing um, wish to sustain this policy. And I'm very pleased to see it. Um, Liberal intervention has got itself a bit of a bad name in recent years. We're not so enthusiastic about the responsibility to protect and so on as we were in the early days after the turn of the millennium. And Iraq and Afghanistan were hard lessons in how you can overreach and state building is not something that uh, outside powers can effectively do. And um, Libya was, in my view, it was an example of um, the lesson of Libya was not don't do it, but don't overreach, don't cheat on your mandate. If you have a mandate to go save Benghazi, go <coughs> save Benghazi. That was a good thing to do. Don't then roll on to regime change, which has led us to the position we find today. But despite all these problems and difficulties, you know, I think there just are times when, when military force is not going to be the answer, but military force is going to be, in some sense, necessary peace support operations if you're going to stop a bad situation getting worse. And... You know, from Sierra Leone to to the Chad operation, commanded in 2007, I think, by an Irish general, to uh, to the intervention in the Central African Republic. These are here are a, a range of examples of, of times when we have deployed military force. It's seldom been 
clear cut, it's always been messy, it's not necessarily been a 100% decisive victory, but it has, it has been a good thing to do and a useful thing to do. And of course today, great many of us are engaged in a, in a, a difficult situation in the Sahel, which um, I'm sure those positions of responsibility in all the relevant ministries these days is, is a cause for a lot of um, tooth sucking and concern, but I, I think probably is still the right thing to be trying to find a way to, to improve the situation there with the element of, of military involvement as, as a necessary part of a wider mix of instruments. Um, And the point is, of course, and it's illustrated by the Sahel, where the French are giving themselves um, a lot of trouble with a, a popular reaction against their presence and a suggestion that um, they're really only there for the uranium. Not, I think, an accusation which is levelled against uh, the Irish contributors on the ground in, in Sahel. Um, and the fact is that um, the so-called larger powers um, with their more obvious national interests involved, can, I think, find it difficult to operate in peace support operations with quite the same effectiveness as um, small states who can be understood to be there essentially for um, altruistic motives for because they, they want to support a rules-based international order, they want to do their best to support peace and stability in the local area. To sum it up, I think that in peace support operations, small states often have a great brand, and I'm not just talking about Ireland, I suppose in some ways uh, the same would apply to uh, um, Swedes and Finns, but uh, we'll hear about that in a while. Um, so that's, that's one area where I think there's um, good scope for um, smaller states to make good contributions to European defence and security. Another area um, which, again, is associated with this idea of, of not having too many dogs in the fight, of the national nature, um, being unfreighted in your approach to things, is simply thought leadership. Um, we all know that President Macron accused NATO of being brain dead recently. I think he might more fairly have, have um, my apologies to um, men in uniform and indeed defence officials here. Um, I do think that, broadly speaking, brain death applies to most defence establishments across Europe. I mean, I do find it distressing how... <coughs> the gap remains, the enormous gap remains between ambition and performance when it comes to uh, what we talk, say about, well, both the wider common security and foreign policy and particularly the, the CSDP. I mean, we all now, do we, believe in strategic autonomy? At least we've signed up to the European strategic strategy. Strategic autonomy makes its, uh, makes its appearance there. Um, and... Well, my, uh, for what is worth, I myself am uh, I'm a very strong believer in this. I do believe that um, in an era in which great power politics are returning, in an era in which we're seeing the um, rise across the world of authoritarianism, we're seeing Western values losing, losing ground, we're seeing um, uh, doubts as to whether, whether the term Western ever still has the same, same validity that it used to in the second half of the last century. And when we face, um, I was going to say, the structural decline of Europe, I don't mean that, I just mean the inevitable structural, lesser, reduced weight of Europe in the world, whether you're talking economically or in terms of demography and so on. You know, the second half of the last millennium was, was 500 years of Europe running the world, and we're not going to do it um, from here on in. And in these circumstances, it seems to me just necessary and inevitable that we all band more closely together take more responsibility for our own defence. Um, I really don't like the idea of continuing to indefinitely to rely on the Americans for our defence, which I don't believe is either healthy or necessary. Maybe that will come back to that, or could do. Um, and ensure that collectively we continue to uh, control the means of, um, of looking after ourselves. I'm 
thinking they're as much about defence, industrial and technological capabilities as I am of specifically of armed forces. Um, I don't know, frankly, how, um, how exactly this um, collectiveness of the European defence enterprise fits with um, your doctrine of military neutrality. I notice with interest that you have, um, you as, uh, as Ireland have uh, uh, joined up to a couple of the, the PESCO projects, um, which uh, I may say I'm not hugely impressed with PESCO as, a, as the answer to our strategic autonomy needs, but it's something, and I'm interested that Ireland has, um, has uh, associated itself with some projects. Glad to see that. Um, but I don't think we're doing nearly enough. Um, and I, I think that uh, you know, the, the deteriorating threat environment, the, the, the shifting nature of our strategic, collective strategic position in the world is such that um, we should be doing much, much more in terms of this just basic, simple stuff about greater pooling of efforts and resources in the defence sphere, um, working more closely together. Why don't we? Um, it's partly a cultural matter. I could do a late on, but I think I, I won't. It's just got a lot to do with vested interests. And the larger the state you are, the larger the vested interests you have, the larger the armed forces you have, with, I mean, inevitably people who are influenced by their career structures, which depend upon national defense, uh, defense organizations. And if you have any sort of defense industry, then you have massive defense. Uh, vested interests in not changing the way you've, you've been doing things for a very long time. And a good example of this, I think, was the, uh, was the British Strategic Defence Review of 2015, which, uh, which, which did manage to think quite originally about um, Britain's strategic position. And it, it diagnosed um, correctly, in my view, at that point, and even, even perhaps today, correctly, the, 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 the principal threats as being terrorism and cybersecurity, and, uh, and prescribed uh, two large aircraft carriers. Um, and this is the sort of incoherence into which you, you get trapped by, by um, vested interest. Um, so what European defence, I'm coming, coming to a close, what I think European defence is um, profoundly in need of is, is fresh ideas and fresh thinking. And uh, I mean, Can it be right that we are collectively watching the collapse of the global arms control regime and doing nothing more in Brussels than deploring it? You know, where, where, are the, where are the ideas for wh what intervention Europe could make in this situation? We're all shooting, well, the larger states are now all shooting off into space. America has its space command. I think the Brits now have their space command, thank you very much. Um, what on earth does all this mean for strategic stability? Who's actually doing the thinking about what the implications of this technological leap um, into space amount to? Um, and then in terms of defense capabilities, um, what we badly need, I think, is more people coming to Brussels and, and saying, hang on, you know, the era of heavy metal and high explosive is indispensable in defense terms, but increasingly nowadays it's overlaid. It's going to be overlaid by issues such as artificial intelligence and, and the whole cyber dimension. And what are we doing about shifting our investments away from the traditional means of, of things that defence companies love to produce into these more um, uncertain, hard-to-grasp um, capabilities of the future. And finally, finally, um, on that theme, actually, of, um, of artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and so on, um, since I know you like nothing better in Dublin than Englishmen coming across and telling you what to do, I, I thought I'd just... Um, uh, mentioned the European Defence Fund, um, and there's a lot of free money out there, or will be, um, and it's very sensibly designed so that it can't just all be poured into the pockets of the, uh, of the big member states and the big companies, but they all have to find dance partners from across Europe to, as I understand it, Dublin has, uh, Ireland has, uh, 
offered a warm welcome, some might say in some aspects almost too warm a welcome, to a great many um, high-tech companies that you in consequence have an increasingly um, tech-savvy workforce here, I had thought that there must be great opportunities for um, Irish companies, universities, institutions to uh, contribute to the sort of projects that will be being conceived under the European Defence Fund um, and to both uh, benefit the national economy and um, contribute in a way which you distinctively, I think, would be able to do um, to moving some of the European defence capability development into, into a more forward-looking direction. Um, and that's enough from me to start with, I think. Thank you.